This is a, a little bit about Xenix, the, the company. We were founded um, by myself and my wife um, in 2009. We currently have about 125 employees. And we're in, it's actually up to about 400 hospitals in the US alone and in over 18 countries we've been um, represented in. That, that makes us one of the, the largest of the environmental hygiene systems um, to our knowledge. Um, we focus a lot and um, in in, in encourage our, our customers as much as possible to publish in the journal. So there are nine outcome studies. So that's studies that look at the reduction of infection rate. So that's C. diff, MRSA, MDROs, re, you know, reductions of the rates of infections. We also have environmental studies, which really look at what happens before and after um, Xenix is used. So you, you standard, you basically, you're, they're swab studies. So swab, clean, swab, use the pulsing on device, swab again, and look at the, the reductions. And I'll go over some of that. Um, we're, we're focused mostly in the acute care, post-acute care. Um, SNFs, which is um, skilled nursing facilities, LTAC, long-term acute care. Um, and we're also in um, operating theaters and surgical sites, a lot of orthopedic. Um, that's my disclosure. Sorry, my throat's a little dry. Um, so what I want to talk about first is why, why should we be using an, um, no touch disinfection? What's the problem? What's the evidence around there? And then I'll go over some of the experience at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So the first question, of course, is where are the bugs? What, what, are the, what are the surfaces we're concerned with? And really, there's been a number of studies at this. This one by Dancer. There's a, there's a number of studies that really target the high-touch surfaces. And what you see is if, if you sample a general um, TSA plate or HPC count, um, you'll find, obviously, bacteria everywhere. Bacteria is everywhere. But if you look and, and subsample that for pathogens, you really find the pathogens are concentrating on the high-touch surfaces. So that's what we, that's what we see here. Um, the study by Lynn also documented that pretty well. That you know, when you really start and you and you speciate your samples, you're going to find that the pathogens on the high-touch surfaces. So that's where what our targets are. We want to make sure those get disinfected in order to pr protect the patients. Um, of course, MDROs is are a, a, a huge issue. Um, we want to make sure those are contained. We know that patients can shed these pathogens into the environment. We know that sometimes we know which patients they are. Often we don't. There, you know, there'll be non-clinical, non-infected um, patients. They won't be on isolation, but still they'll be shedding these pathogens into the environment. Um, and and they, they're viable on, on the surfaces for a long time. And equipment and contamination and cross-contamination is a problem. And really, I bring all this up to, to emphasize the point that merely disinfecting an isolation room is insufficient if you want to control the environment because the pathogens quite rapidly not only escape that isolation room, but those non-diagnosed patients are shedding them into the environment. So if we want to reduce the microbial reservoir, we want to reduce the risk of the environment, we've got to do more than just the isolation rooms. And, and I'll show some data for that. Um, of course, as we know, there's multiple factors of an infection control program. Um, a lot of these we're pretty developed at. We're, we, you know, we're heading, um, you know, we're doing, doing well with the stewardship. We're doing well with some of the surveillance programs. I, I really feel like environmental cleaning is an opportunity where technology can step in and, and alter things. We, we know that, um, you know, surfaces are, we know that pathogens survive a long time in the environment. So spores, five months, um, they've recovered active E. coli five months after Klebsiella. I mean, the, so the pathogens can be viable for, for quite a long time in the environment. And we also know that housekeeping misses surfaces, you know, and that's what I, what I really think about is it's, we're asking housekeeping to do a job that is basically not humanly possible. We're asking them to rapidly clean the environment. They have a really restricted amount of time and also make it pathogen free and safe. And that's just not really a humanly possible task. They need new tools. And often when we talk to environmental services, um, we basically say, you know, the, the, the organisms have evolved. The risk of the, you know, if you get infected, if it was 20 years ago and you got an infection, there was an antibiotic to treat it. But the organisms have evolved, but our tools to address the environment haven't evolved yet. We're still using mops and buckets. But they really need a new tool in order to do their job. You see, you know, quite commonly, we, the pathogens will be recovered after discharge cleaning in rooms. There's a number of studies on this where um, we see positive cultures of MRSA, VRE, C. diff, 
in the rooms after cleaning. So we know that cleaning is not getting all the pathogens. We know something else needs to happen. So let's look at automated disinfection. So when I say automated disinfection, it's any system that, that disinfects, you know, obviously automate it. It's a no-touch system. There are a couple of other um, technologies to do that. There's hydrogen peroxide vapor. There's mercury UV. There's pulsed UV. And there's some other emerging systems that are available. There's some ozone systems and other, other systems like that. So hydrogen peroxide vapor is, you know, very familiar in the UK. Um, we don't see it as much in the US. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is the operational side of things. Um, it can, you know, according to the literature, it's 1.5 to 3 hours per room. And, and that does not, so, and what's happening is if you're, if you're using that to disinfect a room, you're not doing many rooms per day. And that, that means you're not really impacting the infection rate. You can decontaminate that room very well. But as, we, as we've discussed, the pathogens are, are everywhere. And we've got to hit more square footage a day with disinfection. There's mercury UV and there's xenon UV. And, and the point here, and we can, we can get into a discussion about it, but all UV is not the same. They produce different intensities. They produce different wavelengths. Um, and according to the literature, they have different cycle times. So if you go into the literature on um, mercury UV, you'll see about an average of 40 to 45 minutes per cycle time. Sometimes it goes much longer. Um, those studies were done by in the US. So you look in um, American Journal of Infection Control for those. But that's what's reported. Um, our studies uh, for pulse xenon uh, are about, we use five minute positions. So that's multiple positions in a room, five minutes each. Um, you can see differences in cell damage between mercury and pulse xenon. And the reason for that is the type of UV that's produced is different. Pulse xenon will produce a broad spectrum of UVs. So that includes higher energy levels. So it goes down to 200 nanometers, whereas mercury is uh, at 254. Um, and that creates different types of damage. Uh, the pulse xenon has been documented to create photo cross-linking, which is what you see in the, in the column C and F with listeria and E. coli. You see actual cell lysis caused by light. That's because of photo cross-linking in the cell wall. There was a, a study published just recently in The Lancet. Um, so hopefully you guys are, are familiar with this. But it was a large CDC study looking with a, uh, with a mercury device called the TrueD device. They had nine devices in nine hospitals. It was a randomized trial over a multiple year period. Um, what they found in that study was that they were not able to, they had no impact on the C. diff infection rate. They had a, a, an, a, a decrease in MRSA, but it was not statistically significant. And they had about a 30% decrease in VRE um, infection rates. So that, that was one, one study that was published, um, and again, that was a mercury device. And I, and I think, you know, there are two factors there. There's, uh, you know, one type of UV used, and also how they used it was, was different than what we do. Another factor that's, that's going to be different in pulse xenon compared to mercury is material compatibility. When you pulse the xenon lamp, it, the, the, the UV duration is measured in microseconds. So the on time and then the exposure that, that equipment is um, presented with is, is minimal. Uh, a continuous UV light will, pr will produce continuous light for the whole cycle time. What you see in the computer screens is the front and back of a, a computer monitor that was exposed to mercury UV, and you can see the yellowing and changes in materials. And um, that's something we can go into in more detail. We have extensive data on that. So a brief, a brief introduction to our device, and you can come see it at the, we have it, we have it over at the booth. Uh, it's a five minute sporocidal cycle time. We recommend multiple positions for a room. So that's five minutes per position. Uh, we have outcome data. So when we say outcome data, that is published, peer reviewed published data with reductions in the infection rates of C. diff, VRE, SSIs, various MDROs, and MRSA. Um, and those are mostly, they're in, um, some are in the Journal of Infection Prevention here. Um, there's a couple, st there's a study coming out soon in BMC ID. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, the studies are in um, American Journal of Infection Control, and we can provide those references. Um, so basically, you have a protected bulb. Um, it, it raises out of the device, so during transport, the, the, device, the bulb is completely contained inside the device. There's a, a touch screen. We have real-time monitoring of all the data. We know exactly where the robot's been, who's used it, where, you know, what, what's been disinfected, how long it's run for. Uh, and that's reported in real time to an online portal. Um, there are very safety features so that the device will shut off if a door opens. Um, and that's an important thing with all UVC. 
No one can be in the room while the, the devices run. And um, we've also learned a lot from our experience in hospitals um, and our, over, over the years, and, and we've designed a very durable system um, that, that can, that can um, put up with hospital operations. So here's the, the, you know, the best practices for UV light are multiple positions. Um, you, you, you can't disinfect your room from a single position. The way we handle that is we do um, multiple positions. The device is moved, and it's five minutes for each position. We work with housekeeping to integrate that into their, their process, and we've done that quite, a, quite extensively. In an OR, we, the time's typically increased because of the space is increased, and that would be two 10-minute positions in ORs. Um, both of these protocols, there are they're, they're studies that um, will show the reduction after cleaning on high-touch surfaces in the, in the room. So those have been published, and so these are evidence-based protocols. So one of the first questions we asked when, <coughs> excuse me, when we, um, you know, when the, when the company was formed and we were doing research is, you know, we know that housekeeping can't get all the surfaces. So the, you know, the question that we, we got asked a lot was, is pulsinon dependent on housekeeping? If, if housekeeping misses a surface, can we still disinfect it? Because we know the surfaces are missed. So the, um, the VA did a, a study where basically they did a, um, they, they, they did no manual cleaning, uh, and, and they would run the robot. So they basically discharge a patient, they would visually clean the room, and then they'd run the robot and let the robot do the disinfection. Um, there's, a, I think, three studies like this published with what they were calling the quick clean or hotel clean protocol. And, and what they found was not only was it faster, but it was actually gave better disinfection than housekeeping alone. So we'll look at some outcomes data. So this is, um, I hope you can see this slide. It's, there's a lot of data here. Um, so you can see the, the, the journal, the reference, what, what organism we were looking at um, in the setting. So whole house meaning a facility that's acute care. Um, health system is multi-facility. And then there, there's some OR studies. But, and, and then you see the infection reduction. That is a reduction in the infection rate of those organisms. And then what we tried to do is, you know, we gave some special notes. So I'll, I'll run through these a bit. So Miller was published in... Um, AJAC, and that looked at an LTAC, a long-term care facility, and they saw a 56% reduction over a 15-month period. They estimate they prevented 29 cases of C. diff by using the robots. Um, the next study um, looked at a 70% reduction in the ICU, and again, over a 12-month period, they prevented 30 cases. Haas, the, these were done at Westchester Medical Center in the, in the U.S. in New York, um, looked at, uh, they saw a 20% whole house reduction, even though there was about a 500 bed facility and they only had two robots, so they weren't really fully deployed to, to do all of the, all of the facilities. Um, and they still saw a 20, 19% a reduction, and that's 185 cases prevented over 22 months. Levin was a small facility, about 200, 210 beds, uh, community hospital, and they looked at C. diff and they saw a 53% um, a reduction in infection and they're heading about 56% of all discharges. Our recommendation is to head every discharge on the targeted units. Uh, and so we find that that is the fastest and most effective way to reduce infections. Simmons was a three hospital, um, three hospital system. They saw a 57% reduction in MRSA. And again, that's 58 eight cases prevented. And the hospital there estimated their return on investment was 50 to one. Um, Vienna, also was a whole house. They looked at, um, on the ICUs, they did all discharges. And on, um, on, on the non-ICU ward, they did C. diff only. And they saw the infection reductions of MDRs of 29% and C. diff uh, overall of 41%. And then we have two studies that look at the OR. And the OR is very tricky because of the different, the ways the infections are reported. Um, what we'd like to do, and what, what the, 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 the first study did, is they separated out class one and class two SSIs. A class one SSI is a clean wound. So that's your um, hips, knees, you know, those, those type of procedures, whereas a class two SSI has some sort of contamination in the wound. It might be a gut procedure or a dirty case. When we separated those two out, they saw a 46% reduction in class one SSIs, which was 23 SSIs prevented, approximately one SSI prevented every month. Um, simultaneously, the class two SSIs were increasing uh, by about 20% in that, in that study. And I believe this, the savings there were at least uh, half a million dollars. And then Fornwalt looked at hips and knees, and they saw um, the year prior to using Xenix, they saw seven um, hips and knee infection, hip and knee infections. 
and um, after using Xenix, they saw zero. So that was, uh, and, and in the ORs, thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> in the ORs, our, our protocol is nightly use. We're doing some studies now on between case cleaning, so that data will be available, I hope, in a, in a month or two. That's being done at, at MD Anderson. This study was done, this is a controlled study that was done at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And basically they had three units that they assigned um, pulse xenon to and three units that were control units. And the first um, chunk there you say before, it was a six month period. Um, they had the, the, the intervention units had a CDI incidence of 15 and the control was 11 and there was no difference between those groups with a p-value of 0.28. During the intervention period, the, the um, pulse xenon units dropped from 15 to 10 whereas the control units actually increased from 11 to 15. Um, and at that point, the, the difference between the units became um, statistically significantly different. Um, based on this data, um, Mayo Clinic then deployed 12 robots throughout the facility in Rochester, and those are still ongoing now. That's been going on for about a year. So we'll, we're, ho we're hoping they will publish that, that data and their, their change in infection rates soon. So now we'll jump to MD Anderson kind of as a case study. This is the, the facility I'm most familiar with. Um, so in, in 2010, they, they did our very first study, which was looking at VRE. So we looked at VRE isolation rooms. We did three five-minute positions. We looked at two outcomes. We looked at qualitative VRE, so VRE present, yes, no. And then we also looked at HPC count. This was published in ITCHI, the uh, Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology Journal. Um, what we found was that basically for HPC count, housekeeping actually did very little. Um, and we were able to do about 20 times better than housekeeping in terms of overall count. We did some pretty extensive sampling. And in terms of VRE, after um, discharge, 8% of surfaces after standard cleaning were still VRE positive. And after Xenix, that went to zero. So then um, the devices were deployed there. They deployed, they started with, I believe, two devices. And o over the time, over time, they, they've ramped that up to seven. In 2013, they did another study that's, that's also available for you. Um, they basically did a, a non-inferiority study looking at bleach versus pulse xenon. And so this, in this study, they did C. diff isolation rooms. Each arm had 15 rooms. And, and basically, it's a swab study. So surfaces were swabbed before cleaning. They were cleaned with bleach. And then they were swabbed again. Or surfaces were swabbed before cleaning, they were cleaned with quats, then use, which was the standard practice, and then pulse xenon was used and swabbed again. And based on that study, MD Anderson um, eliminated the use of bleach for C. diff isolation cleans, um, for C. diff terminal cleans. So they used pulse xenon instead, that's standard practice that's been going on since 2013. In 2015, they added devices for the OR. They're running them currently every night in every single OR. Um, it's about 38 ORs, I believe, and, um, and I'm going to want to add here for 2017, I'm hoping they will add that they're going to start using Pulse Xenon for between case cleaning in the OR, because they have those three robots there. So this is the environmental study that was done. <coughs> Excuse me. There's three different room statuses. So there's pre-clean, which is, you know, the, basically the patient's discharged, the room sampled. And then there's post-cleaning, post-housekeeping, and then there's post Xenix. And what we did with the study is it was, it was split. So some of the rooms received no cleaning at all. We wanted to get back to that question of, is, are we dependent on housekeeping? What if housekeeping doesn't clean? So we just would sample the surface, not clean it, use Pulse on, and sample again. And you can see housekeeping, so pre-clean was 213 um, CFU per inch, which was, and post housekeeping brought it down to 178. So, and, and I was really surprised by these numbers, because I mean it's a it's a very well-run facility, and yet housekeeping wasn't able to really reduce the amount of bacteria on those high-touch surfaces. After a pulse xenon, we were able to bring it down to 7.8, and there was really no difference whether the surface was cleaned before or not. Um, and that that data is available in the paper, and you can see how uh, the confirmed VRE um, went from 23% pre-clean, 8% post-clean, and then no VRE was recovered after pulse xenon was used. And that, again, that paper was published in, in Itchy. This is um, part of that paper looked at operations, and operations is a very, very important part of this. So 
You can see here some of the timing they did to, to in order to disinfect a room. Um, there was some travel time. The robots were not stored on the floors necessarily, so they had to move. It took about almost four minutes to get the robot to the room. Um, it was very quick to prepare the room, 15 seconds. Um, and then the, the UV was in three positions. That was 12 minutes. Each time there's a safety countdown of 30 seconds, so that's, 100, um, that's 90 seconds or one minute 30. And then there was a repositioning of the device, and that took about 31 seconds and then exiting the room. So this is, so it took about 18, the total process from go get the robot to exit the room was 18 minutes and 48 seconds. What we found as, as, as this moved on and on and we deployed in more and more hospitals is this was essential. It's essential to be able to, to move the robots quickly through the facility and to do enough rooms. If we, if we just did a few rooms a day, it's not going to uh, impact the rates, especially of C. diff or, or MRSA. We have to find the units in which the transmissions are occurring. We have to reduce the microbial reservoir in those units on a routine basis every day, which means targeting all discharges, targeting shared equipment areas, targeting nurses' stations, trying to do everything we possibly can. This is the um, bleach study I spoke about. And if you jump over to where it says reduction, that's probably the, the easiest thing to look at. Um, and basically, the bleach was able to achieve a 70% reduction in the amount of C. diff recovered from environmental surfaces. And um, pulse xenon without any bleach, with a, a quaternary clean, a standard clean, um, was able to achieve an 83% reduction. And that was a statistically significant difference. Um, and again, based on this, they eliminated bleach from the terminal cleaning um, for C. diff isolation rooms. It was actually a very tricky method to do because in order to sample if there are any microbiologists in the room, we had a very um, complicated method for sampling where we had a sterile swab and we were doing larger areas. So it's, it's very difficult to recover C. diff from the environment. So the, the methods are, are fun for microbiologists. Um, this is the robot. Um, it's here in an in OR, but you know, it's designed with, so to um, be easily moved out. The operators are typically housekeepers um, or the cleaners in the facility. Um, we've never in our, in our history just shipped a robot. We'll come on site and we will do this and any of our partners will do this. We'll come on site and do a multi-day training for it because we realize that the technology is one thing, but operationalizing it is, is another thing. And we have to get housekeeping trained. We have to figure out how it's going to be deployed. We have to figure out how all the systems and communication work, and we'll, we'll send our team out to, to help with all of that. So this is you know, an example of compliance reporting. We do a lot of compliance reporting to communicate with the teams that are running the robots. And, and we'll look at different areas. We'll look at how many patients were discharged. We'll look at how, what percent compliance. And we communicate this on a monthly basis with all of our customers. And we really we just want to see the programs be successful. In order to be successful, you know, we'll, we'll meet with them, we'll set goals, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and monitor those goals. We assign, we assign people to each account, and we'll monitor those goals and communicate back. And we're able to see every, uh, you know, detail of, you know, Wednesdays seem to be challenging. You know, what's happening on a Wednesday? Do we need to retrain someone? How can we get the compliance up to where it needs to be? This is MD Anderson data. Um, it's a little busy. But this is looking at, um, from fiscal year, 11 all the way through 16. You can see um, NI is nosocomial infection. Um, you can see the rates, there's the MDR rates. And um, as you parse through this, you know, the bottom line is, let me see here, there was a, a decrease of 41% MDROs over the period of time, you know, since uh, Xenix has been used. So, and so that, that data is available. And then, so I'll, I'll take a, but now I want to kind of localize things into the UK. So this article was published um, last year. I think it, we, we presented at this conference. Dr. Hussein was actually here last year presenting. Um, and this was a study that was done in the U, uh, UK hospital. It was done at um, NHS Queens in Rumford. And basically, they, they had uh, multiple questions. They had questions about operators. They had questions about time. They, had, uh, they did microbiology studies. So they went into the sluice room and they'd bring inoculated plates and disinfect those and show the log reductions. And then they also had um, environmental outcomes. So they went into the um, isolation rooms and used the, the robot. This is, a, again, this is an AJIC, and you can look it up. It was in uh, 2016, uh, and Dr. Hussein's the lead author on that. 
So this is kind of a busy, I just pulled a couple tables from that paper, but you can look at different um, surfaces. You can look at the, um, the impact of Pulsina. So if you, if you go over to table two, you can see you know, where the baseline is. You know, so for example, bed rails went from 26 pre, cleaning got them down to 10, and Pulsina got that down to two. And you can just, that's how you read this table. Um, so you can see the reduction. Some, you know, and it's interesting because some surfaces are more challenging than others. Toilet seats were more challenging, which was interesting. And then that, this, this data lets us go back and adjust protocols to figure out, well, what's happening in, in the, that particular bathroom? Is it too tight? What, what's going on there? And you can see the same on table three. You can see baseline manual cleaning and um, pulsing on. They also found that they did a lot of interviews with users to get a sense of you know, how user-friendly is it, you know, what, what's people's reactions to that. So all that's in the, in the paper. And so after that um, study, um, Queen's Hospital purchased two robots, and they've been running them since June 6th of 2016. They have two robots. There was some press on this, so I, I've just cut, clipped some of that. Um, but basically, they're averaging 46.48 rooms per day. So they've really operationalized this. They've been able to put it into you know, routine operations. They've trained all the staff on it. They also do four theaters nightly. So they're able to do every theater twice a week about. And um, when we pulled this data, they had done 12,000 rooms. And, and, and you know, this has been about six months, so they're starting to look at the HAI data to see what kind of impact they can um, document from this. But I think this is important because a lot of the questions we get is, you know, the, obviously most of our data is U.S. data, and the question is, you know, can it, can it be used in the U.K. setting? Can it be used in U.K. facilities? So this is a great example of how they've been able to operationalize it. We have solutions for multi-occupancy rooms, so we're able to do, disinfect the empty bed space while the other patients are present in the room. We're able to shield the, the UV light. Um, so we have those solutions available, and we're also able to create um, programs where we basically do blitzes, where that, you know, if the whole units, if the whole ward of like four bed ward is empty, you know, obviously we're able to go in and disinfect that, but we're also able to do it when there's an empty bed space. So we just, we use that protocol, we call it empty bed space bathroom. So every time someone comes in, they do the empty bed space, do the bathroom, and, and that's able to really get to some of the areas that it's very difficult to clean when those areas are, when those rooms are occupied. Mm -hmm.